to the second speaker of this session, uh, who is uh, uh, John uh, Libyshoots from uh, Aztecs. Uh, so John is also a former uh, uh, colleague of us at the CCBC, where he worked eight years running the scientific support group. He left in 2013 uh, when he decided to go into consultancy. And um, uh, he then spent the next four years working with companies like uh, Hipotech or Charles Diver Laboratories, where he contributed to a variety of chemoinformatic and bioactive design projects. At the moment, uh, uh, is working um, uh, as an employee for Aztecs, uh, and uh, there he contributes uh, computerized design and support to a variety of cancer and CNS fragment-based design projects. So today, the title of his talk is um, "Is Unusual Torsional Ligand Geometry Prevalent in Highly Resolved Protein Ligand X-ray Structures?" So uh, I am uh, uh, happy to pass on to you, John. And I look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Elenia. And thank, thank you to the CCDC for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to go down the, the rabbit hole that uh, Alice Brink uh, very nicely portrayed earlier today, which was uh, the, the rabbit hole that takes us to the, to the field of protein ligand crystallography and protein ligand structures. And if I can just um, share my screen. OK, uh, so as Elenia has said, I'm currently working for Aztecs Pharmaceuticals. Uh, but the work I'm going to present today is work that I carried out independently of Aztecs. So I'm not actually flying under the Aztecs flag. I'm flying under my own flag of convenience uh, today. Um, OK, so state at the top of this slide what most drug designers believe and that is that when we're designing drugs unusual geometry and the, the strain that's implicit in that uh, should be avoided if at all possible in in the designs that we we put together the designs that we make and if i was to pick any one reference uh, to highlight this it would be this classic uh, paper from the, the roche group in 2008 which showed the, the drug designer how we can use the conformational preferences from the chemistructural database to help us design in good geometry into our designs. So that's what we believe, but what do we actually observe? We actually observe many incidences of unusual ligand geometry in the structures in the PDB. Um, and why is that? And where does that come from? And we also have some uncertainty as what to what strain energy can actually be accommodated as a in a ligand when it's bound to a protein, uh, a, a highly efficient ligand. And some publications have given uh, estimates as much as 25 kilocals per mole. Um, I, I don't believe that's right. I think I could spend a whole talk talking about what's, what's not correct about this particular publication. Um, I won't do that. Um, but a, a more usual uh, estimate is around three to five kilocals per mole. But that could still lead you to uh, some to having some unusual geometry in your in, in your ligands. Um, so what is the what is the actual situation? And um, while I was still at CCDC, we we published on this. We did we did a survey of of geom ligand geometry in uh, protein ligand structures, and this is the work largely of Jana Henneman, who was with us for some some months. Um, and the, the data set for that analysis was, was mostly a moderate resolution data set, um, 1.6 to 3.0 angstroms. And although we were looking for, for molecules that we could clearly say were strained, we had a hard job of that. Um, because in fact, it was very hard to be sure if a poor geometry structure was in fact a poor geometry structure or wh whether it, there was a problem with the refinement and a, a different refinement might have led to a better structure. Um, we did have one or two reasonable resolution structures, and they tended to show less, um, less geometric problems. Uh, but we asked, did, did wonder at the time, what about if we had a, a data set of very high resolution structures? What would the picture be like that in, in that set? Uh, but there were very few available at the time we published this, this study. 
Uh, well, well, time has passed, and in 2016, I had a couple of months spare, and I thought I'd revisit this uh, this uh, analysis and see what was available in the uh, in the PDP. And in that time, um, it, it became apparent that quite a few very high resolution structures had been published, and so there was now a, a sizable data set to work to. And so. Uh, initiated a new study in 2016. Um, analysis of the data required some filtering of the, the, the data sets. So uh, selected structures which had ligands in, of course, ligands with low molecular weight, so they'd be drug-like, at least in that sense. Uh, because we're looking at primary torsional geometry, they should have at least one rotatable bond, and then it's necessary to avoid overrepresentation. So um, to have no more than four of any one protein in the data set. And also there might be some bias from different crystallography groups around the, 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 the world. So the decision was made to have no more than two from any one crystallography groups. And that led to a data set of 81 structures in total. And in, the ligands included both covalently and non-covalently bound xenobiotics. And it also included some cofactors and some substrates or substrate analogs. Now, if you're doing this kind of study, one very important uh, part of the process is to uh, categorize the, the complexes you get out according to the fit of the ligand to electron density. And I'll, I'll go into that in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, but first, I'm just going to describe two other data sets that uh, I created for this work. And the first was a, a reference set from the CSD, and this was created from the top 200 drugs list uh, published by the Nansen Group. Um, and CCDC helped me out with generating this list, and there were 66 entries in that top 200 list, uh, for which there were CSD entries, so that made one of the reference sets. And then the second reference set was from the PDB, and it was a, a set of medium resolution protein ligand structures to compare with the, the high resolution set. Okay, um, just very briefly mention the, the main tool that I'm going to use for this work is, is Mogul, which many of you will have used, uh, a module of the CSDS, and as Robin, Robin gave a great introduction to Mogul, Mogul earlier on, um, it's a way of getting very rapidly information um, about a particular model on, on all the uh, geometric features within that model. And you can take a, a molecule into Mogul, you can search on all geometric features. And if you use Mogul within Mercury, you generate a, a nice spreadsheet. And, and then Mogul uh, identifies for you, according to its own default criteria, what's, what's an unusual feature. Uh, in this case, we're looking at torsions. And then you can go through and analyze that particular dihedral um, and see where it's uh, what the distribution looks like in the CSD compared to your compared to your query. Okay, so that's the tool of choice. Um, Mogul looks at on lengths and angles, it looks at dihedrals, it looks at ring geometries. Uh, in this work, I'm just going to really be talking about uh, dihedrals um, and looking at dihedrals for looking for unusual geometry. And why why do we do that? Uh, well, um, bond lengths and bond angles are, are often predetermined by the refinement program that we, we use in protein crystallography because we, can't, we don't have atomic level resolution. Um, and the same is, is, is true often for, for aromatic rings. Um, but dihedrals are, are not generally biased by the refinement program. They're allowed to freely um, uh, take up their positions. And another Another parameter that uh, Mogul looks at is, is non-aromatic rings, geometry of non-aromatic rings, and this is not biased by the refinement program necessarily, uh, but these are sporadic in nature, they don't appear in every single structure. So that's why uh, this analysis is going to just focus on dihedral geometry. Okay, um, I just want to, before going any further, um, highlight something that again Robin talked about, the current implementation of Mogul treats a rotatable bond as being made up of heavy atom dihedrals. And in this example at the bottom, you can see this, 
this rotatable bond in the center is, is made up of two heavy atom dihedrals. And I'm going to define a rotatable bond as having unusual geometry if both, uh, if all the dihedrals of that, uh, um, making up that bond are, are marked unusual. Um, and now you can do this other ways. It's important to have, just have a consistent method of doing this. And that's the method that I'm choosing to do, to use in this particular work. Um, on the bottom left of the slide, you can see the rotatable bond profile uh, for this high resolution set that has been generated. And just to, just to show you that it's not just made of, of structures which have only a couple of rotatable bonds, uh, we actually have quite a range. And in fact, there's some structures in there which have got, uh, which are highly flexible and have many heavy atom rotatable bonds. Okay. Um, before I move on to the, the categorization according to electron density, uh, I just want to ask another couple of questions, or another question rather. Um, how often do you expect to see multiple ligand conformations bound at a single site? And I say what most drug designers believe here, certainly with my opinion before I did this work, what we, what we really consider is that we see a single binding pose, we, we accept that there is thermal motion in, in most protein ligand structures, and that explains why we don't always see perfect matchup between the pose and its electron density. Uh, and we might expect to see multiple conformer binding in some, where, you, where distinct conformers can be, can be isolated. Um, and why do we believe all this? Uh, well, what we generally observe is, is one binding conformation. That's what, that's what we generally get from the crystallographer. That's what the crystallographer gives us. Okay, well, that was what I thought, and I got a bit of a surprise when I did this analysis, and I'll come to that in a, in a second. Okay, uh, this is the categorization of uh, the that high resolution set according to electron density, and it neatly divides up into thirds. And in the third of the cases, we have a single binding pose where we get perfect fit to electron density. Uh, Another sector, another third of the cases, we get imperfect fit to the electron density. This was perhaps surprising that with these high resolution structures, you're still not getting absolutely perfect fit to the ligand to the electron density. The big surprise, was, though, was that at least in a third of the cases, uh, there, were there was multiple occupancy for the ligand. So the ligand, uh, there were two conformers for the ligand uh, being refined, the crystallographer had taken the time and effort to refine two conformers to the ligand to fit it to the electron density. Um, and sometimes just, just it was just part of the, the ligand that was, was fitted. Um, sometimes uh, it's the whole ligand that was fitted in a different conformer. And that, that, as I say, with, I'm surprised that it was such a large proportion, 30% of cases. Okay, let's compare that with the that picture with the moderate resolution set. Um, and in fact, in terms of the, the number of cases where you get essentially very good fit of the ligand pose to uh, the uh, electron density, uh, the, the picture is about the same, the same proportion uh, where we get good fit to the electron density. The proportion where we get imperfect fit to the electron density is much larger, but of course we don't have the multiple occupancy cases in this case because the resolution is simply not good enough for the crystallographer to try, try to define multiple conformers. Okay, so let's have a look at the, uh, the geometry of these, these particular subsets. And I'm looking at the high resolution set here. And down in the bottom corner, I've got the, the picture for the CSD set of 66 complex fit. And the way I'm representing these pie charts is I'm showing the proportion of, of ligands that have uh, varying proportions of uh, rotatable bonds with unusual geometry. So in this case, you can see that almost 75% of cases in the CSD set uh, have no unusual uh, rotatable bond geometry according to the criteria that I'm using, but there's, there's just over a quarter which do have some unusual geometry in, in those, those poses. If we look at the subset of the high resolution, um, set point set we see a very similar picture it's, it's very comparable we're seeing essentially no difference between this set and the csd 
75% of cases with no unusual rotatable bond geometry, 25% of cases where there is some unusual uh, rotatable bond geometry. What about the imperfectly fitting set? Uh, well, here we see a different picture. We see that in fact, there's, there's about a third where we still have good geometry, but in all the other cases, there is some unusual uh, geometry uh, in, the, in the ligands. So these, these are cases which it's almost certain this is, this is essentially a refinement artifact and, uh, and uh, with perhaps different refinement uh, methods, uh, we could have, could have perhaps found better models. What about the, the double occupancy cases, the multiple occupancy cases? Now, my, my intuitive thought was, well, this is going to be difficult. This is, this is surely a difficult problem to fit the two complements to the electron density, surely the, the uh, geometries are going to be all over the place. Well, that wasn't the case at all. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, the picture is quite similar to the perfectly fitting set. Uh, almost, uh, well, about 70% of cases, we still have no uh, unusual geometry in, the, in this data set. And that, that was another surprise, that the, the crystallography was able to generate these, these multiple conformers and, and get good geometries for uh, just by fitting to the electron density. Okay. So on this slide, I'm showing the, the comparison of that data with the, the same analysis carried out on the medium resolution set. And you can see that uh, in, the, in the case where we've got good, good fit to the electron density, we're actually not seeing a significantly different picture. Uh, we're still seeing a very high proportion of, of molecules which have <clears throat> essentially no uh, unusual rotatable bonds according to the criteria I'm using. And, and similarly, when we look at the, the set which imperfectly fit the electron density, uh, we see a, a greater number of cases where we have unusual uh, rotatable bonds. Okay. So now, um, just for completeness, essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's useful to look at the, the rotatable bond composition of these, these various sets. Um, and <clears throat> I think this, this, this is pretty much as you expect. I think for those cases where we have a single pose fitting perfectly to the electron density, we have a bias towards the, the, the low rotatable bond count um, end of the... Uh, distribution, slight bias. Having said that, there's still some quite a few cases of, where we have highly flexible ligands, where we still have very, where we have no um, unusual rotatable bonds, or very few. Um, and then those cases where we have imperfect fit to the electron density, or we have multiple occupancy, uh, are more biased towards the, the more flexible end of the rotatable bond spectrum. And the same, same is true here for the, the medium resolution set. Okay, so let's, let's just come up with some conclusions for this analysis. If we have a good fit to electron density, uh, we have a low incidence of unusual rotatable bond geometry. And this is, the profile is quite similar to the CSD uh, in this regard. And this is true for both the high resolution and the medium resolution uh, sets. Poor fit to electron density, a higher incidence of unusual rotatable bond geometry. And arguably, this is, this is refinement artifact and should be discounted if we're looking for, for strained uh, molecules. Double conformer binding poses within the high resolution set. We see a surprisingly low incidence, surprisingly to me, um, a low incidence of unusual rotatable bond geometry. Okay, um, let's, I've got a couple more questions. I think this analysis raises a couple of questions. Um, the first question, which I can't answer, but I think is a very interesting question. You recall that the 34% of the, the high resolution set had imperfect fit to the electron density. The question is what proportion of that set could have been re-refined uh, as double, Conformer binding or multiple conformer binding for the ligand. Um, and I think that's 
that that's an interesting question and in principle it it could be done because the the, the structure factors have been deposited so someone could actually go ahead and do that uh, i can't obviously can't answer that question uh at today's today's talk uh, the other question is um we saw that some structures with perfect fit to the electron density do show unusual geometry and what can we learn from such structures so i'm going to now go through uh, a few of those structures and this, this structure is uh, a substrate analog uh, bound to charismatase, um, and it's got one unusual torsion that um, in, in the center of the molecule, this is the Mogul plot. Um, but the interesting thing about this, this molecule is that it's, it's got two carboxylic acids that are bound in the, the active site to, uh, to um, by salt bridges to, to arginines, a very intensely rich interactions there. And in fact, this is a bit of a theme because we, some of the other examples in that high resolution set are also highly polar substrates or substrate analogs uh, bound by strong enthalpic uh, hydrogen bonds. So glycerol 1 phosphate bound to genrayonyl geranyl glycerol phosphate synthase is another example. A carbose, which is a pentasaccharide bound to alpha uh, glucose those are uh, transferase and the cofactor FAD bound to NADH cytochrome P5 reductase all have some unusual uh, rotatable bonds uh, all are bound by strong enthalpic interactions. What about drug-like molecules or drugs even? Um, very few examples with unusual geometry uh, just a couple really in, in, in this set. Um, this, this is an example, which is actually a drug, arbrutinib, which is, which is used for, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a drug that's used for um, leukemias and, and lymphomas. And it's a covalent inhibitor of Bruton's tyrosine kinase. It's linked through uh, cysteine to, to the protein. And this, this ligand actually has a, a, one unusual torsion, and it also has unusual um, ring geometry uh, of this piperidine. And I think the interesting thing here is that this unusual geometry is actually quite close to the point of uh, covalent attachment. And of course, that covalent uh, link um, is going to provide an awful lot of, uh, of binding energy and helps them through your binding. Um, so that, that could be the reason why this it, it, the molecule becomes strained after, after the, the covalent adduct is formed. Another example is this zinc chelating inhibitor of human uh, matrix metalloprotease 12. <clears throat> and again, one unusual uh, rotatable bond in this, this ligand. But again, we're very close to a uh, the zinc binding site, uh, uh, which we could anticipate would be a very strong enthalpic uh, um, interaction. And perhaps again, that is what's, what's driving the, uh, the unusual geometry in this case. So, in summary, then, uh, at least in this data set, we have not found grossly unusual geometry in, in drug like molecules. We've not found them in highly efficient drug like molecules, that is, ones that have been uh, optimized for activity. And that's, that's what we'll usually, usually find in the, in the PDB. Uh, doesn't mean you won't find it whilst you're trying to get to high affinity, uh, but we do not generally find it in highly efficient drug like molecules. Where, where we do see it, I haven't stressed this before, but usually we only see one rotatable bond is marked unusual in, in, in most of these uh, structures. And it most usually occurs in molecules that make strong enthalpic interaction. And these might be covalent inhibitors, metal chelators, and highly polar ligands. Okay, that's, that's the conclusion I come to from this analysis. However, I should caveat this. This is a relatively small study. Uh, obviously, these high resolution structures are going to become much more common in the future. And this is definitely be well worth repeating uh, sometime in the future to, to check that these, these conclusions are correct. Okay. So I'm just going to finish off um, by 
well, I have a couple of take home messages, actually, that's what I'm coming to now. Um, so the, the, the message that the drug design, designer should, should avoid unusual geometry, if at all possible, uh, is true. I don't think we, we doubted that. Um, unusual geometry shouldn't shouldn't be a, a feature of a highly efficient drug molecule. And my message, of course, is to use the, help, use the CSD to help you get there. The other message is really uh, perhaps a challenge for the protein crystallographer. So uh, perhaps I've shown at least 30% of cases, and maybe up to 60% of cases, if we include those that imperfect fit, uh, it's maybe 60% of cases, we might be able to generate two good conformer do two good conformers with good geometry in the binding site. Now, this is this is information that the drug designer just doesn't have at the moment. Um, and it could be useful information to see both those conformers. Um, and in fact, um, other people have published on, on this, this kind of problem. Uh, this is a publication by the uh, by the Schrödinger group. Um, where they estimate that this multiple conformer problem occurs in about 29% of cases of the examples they've looked at. And I think it might be, might be, might be more than 29%, might be up to 60% of cases. Can we, can we, even with moderate resolution structures, try to generate these multiple conformers of binding for the, for the ligand? And can, can that help the, the drug designer? And, and can we use the CSD to help us um, uh, produce these better, um, these multiple conformer findings. Now, now I'm I'm a bit out of the loop on this. Uh, I've not been up with developments in uh, crystallography refinement uh, software, uh, but using say the, the CSD conformer generator to generate quite strictly defined poses, which can then be put into the refinement programs. Um, can can we do that? Can we modify the refinement programs so that they we restrict the confirmations that are used? And will that allow us to to fit multiple conformers even in in moderate resolution uh, protein structures, which after all are, are the ones that uh, we as the drug designers are generally uh, faced with? And I'll leave that as an open question. Maybe maybe someone in the audience has a, has a viewpoint on it. Okay. Just to finish off. Um, Mogul uh, is, is, a, is a great tool, and, and it's a tool that the, the medicinal chemist uh, can use. Uh, and, and a number of groups have tried to make it easier for uh, medicinal chemists to have access to, to Mogul in, in, a, in a good way. Um, and uh, the Roche Group uh, published their torsion analyzer back in 2013. This is a very nice tool, uh, unusual. Well, rotatable bonds, the geometry of rotatable bonds is, uh, is highlighted using a traffic light system. So it's very easy to see when you've got unusual uh, geometry in the, in the, in the ligand. Um, we've also, in Aztecs, had an implementation of Mogul in, as part of the Aztecs viewer. Uh, here we can see a, a Ramachandran plot you can generate. This is for a, a dithioether. Um, and you can see where the, the structure that we've got there sits on that plot. Um, so the, these are ways, and I'm sure other people are doing that, the, the, the mogul can be brought to the to direct use by the, the medicinal chemist. I, I should say with, we've had to replace the Aztecs viewer at Aztecs, and we've got a new viewer, and, and then we've got a new implementation of mogul within that viewer, which uh, uh, we're looking forward to, to showing people in the future. It's a very nice implementation, and uh, we, we, we like it. Well, I like it very, very much indeed. Okay, um, that's really <clears throat> that's really all I've got. Um, just want to acknowledge uh, CCDC uh, for, uh, for giving me the loan of a, a, a license for a few months, and also Philip Andrews for helping me out with the CSD uh, uh, set of CSD set of drug molecules. I also like to thank the folks at Aztecs for, for useful conversations on the on this topic. In the past. And lastly, I like to. Thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you, John. Uh, very good talk and with good insights in this uh, also surprisingly multi-state structure. I was wondering whether any of the crystallographers use actually 
uh, CSD or MOGA link to the refinement, and that links up to your final comment about using the conformer generator to generate high probability conformation to then fit into the more moderate quality structure. So unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions. There are a couple, one from Jason, uh, who is asking about um, uh, if uh, the unusual structure that you see are transition states. Uh, so you may have uh, answered this question already, looking at the uh, few examples where you have Antarctic contributions, like the covalent ligand or the zinc binding ligand. But I don't know if you want to add more. Um, no, that's a, that's a very good question, uh, Jason. Um, I, I don't, didn't see any any uh, transition states uh, in the in the data set I, I looked at. I, I know that there are some in the in the PDB um, in prismatic mutase. I think there's there's one that's that's uh, where, where a transition state was being captured. But in the in the data set I looked at, I, I didn't really identify any. Any ones that I, I could identify as transition states. And finally, a question from Chelvar. So, in cases where there are multiple poses, how different are the overall fit of the ligand? Do the poses of the bull molecule different, or is it a case that it is a substructure of the molecule that differ? Also, in cases uh, of that, multiple, yeah. Uh, and there is a yes, that's a, that's a that's a very good question. Um, in most cases, it is just part of the ligand where the uh, where you get the difference in conformation. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's fifty percent of the ligand. Sometimes it's thirty percent of the ligand. Um, sometimes ten percent of the ligand. Uh, not very often is it a completely different conformation. Um, there was a second part of the same question asking if the uh, multiple poses show different interactions with the protein. Um, oh, that's a, that's a good question, which I, I have to say I've not really not really analysed in 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 depth. Uh, in fairness, sometimes the the, the pose is, is is closer to the the, the solvent accessible surface, um, and uh, the, the interactions with the protein are are not so not necessarily so strong. That, that certainly occurs in some cases. Uh, that, that's a very good question, and I should probably go back and. Uh, Look at that, that in more detail, and uh, see what I can find. Okay, so uh, I think that's it for now. If